What is up, y'all? Today we'll be doing a book analysis of J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Per usual, there will be spoilers involved. Now let's jump in. Catcher in the Rye is essentially a coming-of-age story with a twist. It's a unique story because it's a story that mourns death, learning how to grapple with one's own mortality, learning how to die. Out of this theme of death is my thesis, that Catcher in the Rye is a depiction of the truth that we can only come to know life through death. Now let's break down what that actually means. How can we actually come to live through death? In Catcher, we spend 48 hours following around a Holden Caulfield, who's a angsty 16 year old with an existential dread of death and a terrifying well, a refusal to grow up. Holden is, in short, he's at war with the world. He believes the world to be phony. Before we go any further, we need to break this down and what this means when he calls everything a phony. Why is he so angry at the world? Why is he afraid of death and growing up? The fear of death and the fear of growing up are actually intertwined. To grow up is to die. There's a, a loss of one's innocence when you grow up. So when, what's dying, figuratively, when you grow up is your old childhood self, that golden age, that nostalgia of, of simpler times when everything was perfect and you were sheltered by your parents and you were totally dependent but nurtured for. It's it's very easy to glorify these, these good old days when everything was nice and simplistic and good and want to hold on to that, which is exactly what we see with Holden. Of course, the reality is Holden can't stay a child forever. To be forever infantilized is to be a manifestation of the Oedipal complex. If one refuses to grow up, one essentially begins to wither and decay. And in other words, it's, it's another sort of death, but unlike the death of your, your childish innocence, it's just a slow, drawn-out spiritual decay as you don't properly grow in the way that you should or could had you uh, decided to sacrifice who you were for the person that you could become. And when we bring all of this back to Catcher in the Rye, we see what's at stake for Holden here. By the time we see Holden, he's so angry because he's so afraid. And he's so afraid because he's at a significant crossroads in his life. There's two directions he can go. He can make the sacrifice and, and grow up and become an adult, or he could go on the less ideal path of holding on to his, his idealistic ways. And as such, see him continue to be overcome with this sense of rage and dread and, and negativity that's crushing him psychologically. So ultimately, for Holden to grow up is for himself to learn how to die. Sacrifice who you are such that you can be reborn into who you might be. Now it's important to take a deeper look into Holden's psyche to, to understand why he has such an attachment to childhood and such a huge fear of death. His fears are actually elucidated by his loves, and there are three characters in the, the story that he consistently shows love for. Those characters would be Ellie Caulfield, his deceased brother, uh, Phoebe Caulfield, his younger sister, and Jane Gallagher, his distant love interest. While these three characters are eclectic, they all share a specific commonality. They collectively represent the illusion of nostalgia and childish innocence that Holden holds onto so dearly. If we start with Allie, well, Holden places Allie on a pedestal. He speaks of him as if he was a boy of near perfection and imbibes on his deceased brother the type of hero worship that you only see for someone who is already passed. It rings true of that old uh, cliche Batman quote, die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. With Allie, what we see is he died a hero. Because he's dead and no longer part of the real world, Holden can use him to glamorize this ideal that doesn't exist in reality. Likewise, Holden loves Jane, but he never actually speaks with Jane. He never calls her, he never talks to her, he never makes any advances towards her. The implication is that he knows that he idolizes Jane. He's imbibing on her the sense that she is a, a symbolic divine feminine, this perfect woman who's the manifestation and embodiment of grace. She has a life-giving and life-redeeming quality. Of course, his fear is that if he actually does make uh, advances advances towards her, I mean, one, he risks rejection, but two, actually getting to know her risks genuine intimacy. And with that intimacy comes a fall of his ideals, that he'll realize that she is not this perfect woman that he holds her to be in his mind. This now brings us to the last person that Holden genuinely likes, which is Phoebe. Phoebe is a child, and as such, she's a living manifestation of the ideal that Holden holds in his mind. Phoebe, however, doesn't affirm Holden's delusions. In fact, she spends a lot of the story just chastising him, saying that he's bitter and cynical and doesn't like anything, and Holden doesn't really have any good uh, good counters to these, these claims. He finally begins to have a sense of self-reflection, and perhaps realizes that some of the inadequacies are not due to the very inadequate structure of the world itself, but maybe that he himself is just the problem. As Holden talks about his uh, you know hopes and dreams with Phoebe, we, we see the torn duality of his interior life, that he has two opposing uh, desires inside of him. One to be a kid, the other to grow up. This gets uh, depicted particularly through his talk about being the catcher and the rye. To actually explain what the catcher and the rye is, Holden likens it to he imagines a field of rye where there's uh, children that are playing around and it's his job to stand by the edge of the cliff and catch all the children who might fall off the cliff. And I quote, I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. 
What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't look where they're going, I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I would do all day. I would just be the catcher in the rye all day. Well, this admission shows the, the duality of Holden. By being the catcher in the rye, he still affirms his, his uh, ideal in that the childhood is the truest way of being and he wants to shelter and protect all children so that they can forever stay in that state of grace, that they can forever stay in the, the field of rye. But at the same time, we see that he actually wants to have a job. He wants to be the catcher in the rye. And this desire to have a job is the desire to be a productive member in society. Or in other words, it's a, a desire to actually grow up. And this is the spirit that he has to listen to, the spirit to want want to be the catcher in the rye, uh, within that calling forward, that exhortation to grow up is actually the call for him to live up to his potential and sacrifice his childhood to become the person that he could become. And this is really where we see his goodness. And he wants to serve that which is good and true and beautiful. And this love that he, he begins to foster in his heart, it really begins to blossom by the story's closing scene. We end the story with a, a very cathartic moment where Holden watches Phoebe spinning around on a carousel. And I quote, then the carousel started and I watched her go round and round. All the kids tried to grab for the gold ring and so was old Phoebe. And I was sort of afraid she'd fall off the goddamn horse, but I didn't say or do anything. You see, the thing with kids is if they want to grab for the gold ring, you have to let them do it and not say anything. If they fall off, they fall off but it is bad to say anything to them. And so here we see that Holden is beginning to realize the error of his ways. He realizes that he can't be the catcher in the rye, that much as he'd love to protect the children from falling off, he has to let them live with that risk. It's impractical to try to protect children from the world. They have to come to know the world. They have to grow up too. As Holden lets go of this illusion of being the catcher in the rye, he also lets go of this delusion of holding on to his own childhood. He's finally ready to let his childhood go, and in a sense, he's finally ready to figuratively die. What he's doing in this death is he still is honoring the calling of the catcher in the rye, but now he's delineated with truth, and he'll find a, a better way to channel his spirit such that he can still bring that same desire to be productive and protective of that which is true and good and, and do it in a way such that it's constituted with reality. It's an agonizing euphoria as he mourns the death of his childhood, but also begins to welcome the ushering in of new life, of the adventure of becoming an adult. And with the self-knowledge comes redemption. Not only does he redeem himself, but the world gets redeemed in his very own eyes. In fact, Holden even mentions in the epilogue as he's moved out to California that he has come to miss everyone from New York, even his old bullies and enemies from back in the day. And this is where we see a further semblance of a Holden donning that of a Christ-like figure. Again, if we think of Jesus Christ, what he does is he dies and has a rebirth, and through his own rebirth, he redeems both himself and the entire world. And in a similar sense, as Holden dies, the world gets redeemed in his eyes. It's no longer such a phony place. Life is no longer as miserable for himself, so he's redeemed, the world is redeemed, and he also begins to develop this sort of unconditional love for everyone, even his enemies. He, he, he loves thy neighbor as thyself. So yes, Holden Caulfield has finally died, and a reborn finally begun to grow up. In conclusion, my original argument was that the catcher in the ride teaches us that only in death can we truly live. Again, Holden's agony was a refusal to die. He refused to sacrifice his childhood for adulthood. Only when he finally surrendered, when he finally died, did the world transform as he transformed. And with this dramatization, we recognize a universal truth. As humans, we're all constantly called to make sacrifices, and all of us have this call to be the the catcher in the rye. And, or in other words, we all feel a call to serve that which is virtuous and good, you know, the highest good that we can conceptualize. And as we answer this call, the call of the catcher in the rye, you could say, uh, that's really calling us to move forward because we can't truly answer this call unless we make sacrifices, unless we let go of our, our present self and our inadequacies in, in favor of becoming that which we could become. And that's because death is ultimately the great unknown. It can archetypally be represented as that of the many unknowns of life. The only way that we can come to truly know life is to continuously face, encounter, and entangle ourselves with that which we don't know, that which we don't understand, that is which beyond our comprehension. And as such, the only way to truly know life is to die. And as we come to know death, we come to truly know life. And that concludes my analysis. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it as always. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd encourage you to like, comment, and subscribe if you'd like to see videos similar to this one. And as always, I hope y'all all have a great day. Thanks.